economics, science and international action. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, just one point of housekeeping before we turn to our three speakers, which is, of course, um, do use the Q&A function. Here you are. Here are your, here's your guidance on how to do it. If you've got questions, put in questions at any point, and you can also upvote questions, which really helps as chair if you can spot the questions that are getting a lot of support. And do please use the Q&A function, not the chat function. Uh, and um, we can then be guided by the questions that great, create the greatest interest. Uh, and uh, feel free to start putting down your questions at any point from now. And here is your guidance on how to upvote as well. Good. Well, we are today focusing on biodiversity. We're going to have three uh, speakers, and then we'll turn to Q&A. We're being innovative today. We're having a slightly different format in which is I'm actually going to put some direct questions to our speakers in turn, and then we will have the Q&A. Uh, and because Dr. Stephanie Ray sadly is not able to be with us this evening, Sally Haynes has heroically joining us for the Q&A section, which she'll be handling in place of Dr. Ray. Um, but let me begin by turning to our first speaker, Professor Sapatha Desgupta, who has been a professor of economics at the University of Cambridge since 1985, uh, written very widely on a whole range of issues of which the valuing of the natural world is a key part, but that his excellent report on that um, out this year, commissioned by the Treasury, draws on strands of his work that he's been conducting over decades. And for me personally, I have to say, he kind of gave me a copy of his book, Time and the Generations. And for me, with my interest in intergenerational equity, his rigorous economic analysis of the questions of how we value the future, including the future when uh, we are no longer alive, but, uh, but uh, our descendants are, is a extremely crisp and lucid account of some incredibly complicated issues. Now, Professor Sapatha Desgupta produced his very powerful report back in February. It is now being considered by the Treasury. We're looking forward to a response. I must say, I think that, um, it, I mean, it is a massive report stretching to almost 500 pages, but the preface is a model of economic um, analysis and argument. And he goes on to really bring to the fore a lot of the key issues that will be considered at the United Nations Conference on Biological Diversity, which has its 15th COP meeting in October this year. So if I may, let's begin with uh, Partha. And I'm going to ask as my first question about the economics profession of which Partha is a distinguished representative, overlooking nature because uh, your review is really about bringing nature back into economics why has nature been overlooked by economists for so long why has it proved so difficult to incorporate into conventional economic models and do you think that now following your work and work of other economists, at last we are going to have economic analysis that includes a proper value of nature and diversity. Well, starting from the end, um, David, the, I hope very much so, that's, that's, that's for sure. But your main question was about why is this missing? And I, it's very hard for me to explain, but let me have a whack, which is that ecology is a relatively new subject discipline. Um, good textbooks have, are avail have been available only for the last few decades, not much more. That's point number one. Point number two, people don't see the signals from nature that easily. We're making use of nature's goods and services all the time. Our lives depend on it. Um, but we don't, it's hard to record them. And particularly, they're not recorded because they're not converted into prices. Um, Market doesn't function for a variety of reasons that it goes into. So it's easy to overlook it. And it's not just economists who overlook it, nature. Pretty much everybody <laughs> overlooks nature if you think about it. Um, but I think there's no intrinsic reason why ecology is a hard subject to graft into economics and blend it within economics. And uh, the review tries and do that. Thank you very much. Um, let, I remember 
wonderful little piece of analysis on the pollinating function of bees, which ended up concluding that a bee was a flying hundred dollar bill, which was a very crude uh, an attempt to summarize the fact that it carried out a very valuable function. Um, you have this powerful concept in your report uh, of inclusive wealth, moving from flows to stocks and moving from gross to net. Would you like to take us through the power of your concept of inclusive wealth, please? It's a really very intuitive notion. And I think private companies have no difficulty doing that because they have balance sheets. So we, nations don't have balance sheets. We've got into a state habit of uh, estimating flows uh, by GDP, which is an income, it's so many dollars per year, you see. Um, that's not, that's the first weakness, because we do need an inventory of things, objects, durable goods. And we want to know, if we want to discuss uh, sustainable development, for example, you need to know the assets that you are handing over to the following year, uh, and in comparison to the assets that you inherited the previous year. Okay, so that's for sure. That's not, that's not the, the hard bit that we want to go in for stocks. But the other problem with GDP, the flow, is that it doesn't take into account the depreciation of capital, which is something that if you studied stocks would automatically handle because you'd be asking is the stock of X more or less than what it was last year? And if it's not, why not? And somebody says, oh, it's depreciated say a wetland has got deteriorated, has deteriorated. So inclusive wealth is nothing other than a confirmation of the fact that what you're trying to measure is an inventory of your goods. And of course, if you can price them, uh, get the value social worth of those objects, then you add the values and that would be your wealth. So it's like a household determining its own wealth, here's a nation uh, determining its wealth and how it passes on from year to year. That's inclusive wealth, and it's inclusive for two reasons. We use the word inclusive for two reasons. One is that you're using social prices, not necessarily market prices, for the reason that I've alluded to in the answer to your first question, namely, much of nature doesn't have a price in the market. Uh, and the other is that uh, it includes natural capital, nature, not just produced capital and human capital, like education and health. You include all the, the whole bundle of ecosystems that you've inherited. And do you envisage that the concept of inclusive wealth, do you, do you, are you optimistic that it is going to become part of the framework of an ec economic analysis used by the British Treasury and in other finance ministries? And, and how will it sit alongside GDP? How, how do you see that shaping up in the future? Well, first of all, I think the, the first question, yes, uh, that's the one thing I'm optimistic about, because it's almost inevitable that it will happen largely because it's got a very strong theoretical backing. I mean, it's, the foundations are absolutely solid. It's not a question of my opinion versus your opinion. It's, it's a mathematical theorem that if you want to discuss welfare or well-being, then you really ought to be looking at assets, the stocks, on the basis of which our, 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 our lives depend. So that's, that's for sure. It's happening slowly. Um, several countries are adopting it. The UK is quite advanced in it, actually. You have this sort of natural capital committee you're not actually estimating inclusive wealth, but you're trying to estimate a component of it, a part of it, that bits of natural capital. And that's a very good start. And nobody's saying you should add everything up and have a wealth account. You really keep it separate because it's very hard to judge the relative values. Um, the, the inclusive wealth is essentially an ideal. And in practice, you're going to cut corners and have uh, China is moving in that direction. So there are quite a number of countries which are uh, in, uh, engaged in it. Uh, it's inevitable. How will it sit with GDP? I think it will sit very comfortably because these two measures are designed to serve different purposes. GDP was invented to give a sense of the extent of economic activity at any, in, in a year, let us say. Uh, for short-run macroeconomic management, it's, in, it's, it's invaluable and it will remain so. Where we make the mistake is to use that index to discuss economic success over the long run. That's that's a big mistake. Right, yes, thanks, thanks very much. And then just bring us on to your report's proposals and the broad transitions that you think we need to now engage on to 
as we properly value nature. Just take us through those transitions and how you uh, how you see them being playing out. Well, these transitions that we mentioned are really not uh, uh, addressing the same point. Uh, one is the first one we highlight is that, and that's the, absolutely crucial, it's the bedrock of the whole review. The, the finding from the earth sciences, from ecologists, as well as some economists, that our total demand, humanity's demand for nature's goods and services vastly exceeds nature's capacity, ability to supply it on a sustainable basis, okay? And we're managing it by eroding nature, depreciating it, uh, which connects with the earlier points I've made. So the first thing is to address that. It's that we're really in, this is a firefighting situation and all finesse is to be avoided. You really have to find ways to cut down this gap to zero. If sustainable development means anything, it has to make it zero. Two, as not really addressing that, but for the longer while we really need to move into a asset management uh, view of nature uh, so that their entire uh, language we use for economic analysis brings nature absolutely central to economic decision making. Uh, and inclusive wealth is just one part of that. It's really essentially a language difference. And we really need to recalculate, re-estimate, and re-study uh, our performance through that. And the third, is to, the third is really the changing of institutions which will support these two activities. And the institutional changes are large in number. And I'll just mention three, just to give you a sense and, and then you can, um, at the local level, it's very important not only to think about the global level because all of us as citizens are living in local surroundings and our activities are confined to that. So at the local level, I would say for urban areas, one of the key recommendations is we really have to go for gardening, much more re green space. It's good for our health, quite apart from the fact that it rejuvenates nature in the local environment. At the national level, uh, one of the first things we ought to be doing is to remove subsidies for nature. In fact, nature is not only zero priced, as I was suggesting, free. It's negative price because we subsidize its use. We're paying ourselves to degrade nature. That needs to be removed. And a third is a long shot, but it's something that I really have tried to boost in the review at the international level, is it's high time we have an international institution created like the World Bank and the IMF, but with charged with managing, monitoring and managing the global commons, like the open oceans, uh, the atmosphere, instead of leaving it to essentially the, open, the seas are of course free to use for fishing or transportation. And this could be an institution which could raise vast sums of money uh, and save the ocean protect the oceans and could be used for a variety of other purposes. Very illuminating, very helpful. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Um, we will now, we will come back to many of those profound issues in Q&A, uh, but let us now move on to our next panelist, Professor Yadvinda Mali, uh, who is Professor of Ecosystem Science at the University of Oxford. Um, he has played an important role in drafting the G7 Science Academy's statement on biodiversity, leading for the, for the UK Royal Society on that. Um, and that really uh, follows up very much on the underlying analysis we've just heard from Professor Desgupta. Uh, so thank you very much indeed, Professor Marley, for joining us this evening. Um, tell us about the background to the G7 Science Academy's statement on biodiversity. Um, why did you uh, produce it and what are the key points? Well, uh, there was a feeling that uh, the G7 uh, have a major role to play in addressing the biodiversity crisis. Uh, the G7 accounts for 10% of the world's population, but about 40% of the world's consumption of biological resources, uh, the consumption of nature. So there's an important moral role for the G7 to play in this, and also a potential of leadership there. And if, if this uh, group of nations that is so influential and also has a large fraction of the global wealth can take major actions, both within the G7 countries, but also support actions across the world as a whole, uh, they can play a defining role in moving things forward in this arena. And so uh, 
uh, uh, together with the science academies of the other G7 nations. So the Royal Society uh, pulled together a set of recommendations after several meetings and discussions. Um, but briefly, uh, there are three recommendations in total. The first one was very much aligned to what we just heard Arthur talk about, which is about uh, working to embed multiple values of biodiversity into economic planning and thinking uh, and multiple values of, of, of human well-being as well to go beyond narrow economic definitions to a much more integrated uh, approach and uh, the second uh, recommendation was about what we termed integrating earth systems thinking into planning for the future and linking up economic planning human development planning with understanding of climate and biodiversity and joined up uh, uh, decisions of uh, uh, pathways forward. And the final recommendation was around monitoring biodiversity. How will we know when things are going wrong, but also when things are going right? What are the gaps in our uh, ability to understand the world's immense biological diversity? And how can we improve that both uh, in terms of uh, technological capacity, but also in, in strengthening capacity in the global south, where most of the world's biodiversity is found. Thank you very much for, for identifying those, those three key themes. Um, one of them is, is this kind of integrated earth system thinking, which you say you, you believe should, uh, any, the academies do, generate cross-sectoral solutions. Now, a lot of the people who will be participating in this event will have a background in science and technology, will be involved in shaping these through, through work they do either in the com commercial sector uh, or uh, in the research and government sector. So could you tell us a little bit more about what these integrated earth system thinking solutions look like? What kind of things people who are sitting there listening to this managing budget should be doing? Yes, uh, I, can, I can run through a few examples. So the, the underlying principle is thinking about the biophysical limits of the earth, uh, the capacity of biodiversity when thinking about economic plans or trade plans or, or others and so bringing that in there. But just to run through a few examples, uh, uh, establishing pathways that combine sustainable agricultural re yields, so improving nu nutrition for humanity while protecting biodiversity and staying within a safe climate space. Uh, another one is uh, uh, very timely now is managing biodiversity and trade to minimize the risk of emergence and spread of infectious diseases, both the emergence originally, but also the international connectivity around them and having protocols around that. Uh, one that's also uh, you know, rising in prominence is the idea of nature based solutions, having ways that can contribute towards mitigating or adapting to climate change, but also help us address the biodiversity crisis and can also uh, help in, in terms of human, human development. Uh, understanding our supply chains better. So when we're uh, consuming things for, in, in local shops, uh, can we have transparency and where they're coming from, what the biodiversity and environmental impacts are there? And on the, uh, 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 and also not just recognizing things in terms of impacts where biodiversity exists, but also recognizing the fundamental importance of demand in, in the G7 nations in shaping those patterns overall. So for example, one thing is encouraging a shift towards more plant-based diets. And not, not necessarily everybody becoming a vegetarian or vegan, but decreasing the footprint of meat uh, in, uh, in our diets, and, uh, because that is a major cause of much of the world's land use, which is a major cause of biodiversity loss and degradation. Thanks, thanks very much. And then, um, we've obviously, you, you mentioned as your third strand, sort of monitoring. Um, just tell us, especially with the COP meeting coming up in October, the, just tell us what kind of monitoring you would hope to see as a result of that. How can we know how we're doing? Well, I think there are two aspects to it. One is, uh, say, in countries like the UK, we have a relatively decent understanding and monitoring of our biodiversity, of many aspects of our biodiversity. But in many countries in the tropics where I've worked a lot of my career, it's really hard to support that detailed long-term biological tracking, partially because the biology is so much more overwhelming, there's so much more of it, and partially simply because the resources and the capacity aren't there. Uh, and I think there, that there's, there's huge potential to, to really strengthen those monitoring networks, particularly in these biodiversity-rich countries. And also perhaps extending it beyond 
the obvious charismatic aspects of monitoring. We all love birds and mammals and they're quite well studied and monitored overall. But it's the insects, for example, that are crucial to many of the essential life support functions of biodiversity or the soil creatures. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a vast biological understanding there, but there's much more that we need to understand before we understand when things are beginning to fall apart or when we're beginning to rebuild natural ecosystems sufficiently to keep them healthy and resilient. Great, thanks very much. Those are also issues I'm sure we'll come back to in the Q&A. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Marley. Thank you. Um, our third panelist is Dr. Stephanie Ray. Um, unfortunately, uh, she has not been able to join us uh, this evening, but we have a pre-record of a, a brief exchange between Gavin Costigan, our director, and Dr. Stephanie Ray, who's an ecologist, a director of RSK Biosensus, RSK Wilding and Nature Positive. And I hope now, Gavin, we will be able to play that exchange. Okay, uh, the first question. Uh, we have the United Nations Biodiversity COP in October this year. What is the UN Convention on Biodiversity and what is this COP meeting trying to achieve? Okay, well, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity is, is seeking, as, as the name would suggest, to protect biodiversity globally. But it's not just about conserving biodiversity. This isn't just something that's there um, <clears throat> for those of us who with an interest in, in wildlife to be concerned about. Um, it's also looking at the sustainable use of natural resources. So the goods and services that arise from biodiversity and how those, those are used in a way that means they'll be available for use by future generations. And it's also around the equitable sharing of those benefits from biodiversity and natural capital. So um, between countries and between parties to the convention. So that those are those are some pretty big aims. And obviously the, the convention uh, arose um, in Rio in 1992 at the Earth Summit. So it's some 30 years ago. Um, and since then we've had regular meetings of the, of the parties uh, on <clears throat> on bi biological diversity and we've had series and series of targets that we've yet to to achieve so the Aichi targets and the most recent which have and uh, none of them have been have been completed in their entirety and so this COP in China in in November October is the is the big one essentially this is the one where we need to actually listen to all of the guidance that we've been given. We, we listen to um, the, the data on how biodiversity is declining and there've been many global reports about that. And we listen to views of people like Professor Das Gupta about how we need a complete shift in our economic systems. And um, this, this is the decade we have to do that. The next 10 years are declared the UN decade of, an, of ecosystem restoration. And, and literally, you know, we're already one year in. We have nine years to deliver this. Thank you. Okay, uh, second question here. But biodiversity is clearly an international issue. But in terms of the UK, what does our national position on biodiversity look like? In terms of how well our biodiversity is doing, um, we clearly have significant issues. Britain is, is actually one of the, the, the most, um, one of the countries where biodiversity has declined the greatest. So we have very little natural habitat within the UK. Um, and if you take my particular, my particular specialization is mammals. Uh, if you look at British mammals, 25% of them are at risk of extinction. And so, you know, if we can drive common rapidly breeding species like rodents to the brink of extinction, we've got a significant problem on our hands. But obviously, um, it's not <laughs> part of the story about how well we're doing on biodiversity relates to the, the legislation and policies that are in place to protect it. And here we're looking quite good here in policy terms, in our approach to dealing with this crisis, we're ahead of a lot of countries. And I think we need to build on what we've written, what we've signed up to, what we've said we'll do, and make sure that we're actually doing the 
big structural changes to put those things in place. So we have great legislation um, within, within the UK that's derived from EU policy. We have some great ideas coming out of the new Environment Bill, which we hope will be published later on this year. Um, and, and we've got pockets of really great practice in ecosystem restoration, habitat restoration, rewilding, but we need to bring these things together, make it a policy and put it front and center of where we're going. Thank you. Okay, the third question. Um, a significant part of the solution to tackling biodiversity loss will have to come from business. What do businesses need in order to take action and, and what's holding them back? Okay, well, first of all, yes, a lot of a lot of this will fall to business, of course, because you know that's where that's where economic activity comes from, if you like. But there's a spectrum. It isn't just about businesses, a whole spectrum from what can we do at international treaty and at government policy level, right through to what can I do as an individual. And one of the steps in, in there, in that spectrum, is business. So what can business do? Well, a huge amount of things, first of all. First of all, stop thinking that sustainability is all about carbon. Stop thinking it's all about let's get to net zero, let's, what are we doing for COP26? And start thinking about the wider measures of sustainability. You know, they're all familiar, everyone's familiar with that sort of three-legged stool view of sustainability, of environment, social and economic issues you need to be working on all of them the stool needs to be balanced or or you're not going to be sustainable no matter how rapidly you try to get to net zero so that's that's the big thing they've got to do they've got to start thinking in terms of how they use all natural resources and then i'd say the other element is they need to think in terms of the whole of life and the whole of their value chain rather than just you know what stops at the factory gate for example. So, you know, where are your raw materials coming from? Are you using materials that have significant natural resource implications? Does your process take a lot of water? Um, how do people use your products or dispose of them at the end of their life? Your responsibility is, is much broader than the immediate activities that you have control of. So I think businesses need to start thinking in a different way in order to tackle these crises and to make themselves fit for the future to avoid some of the business risks that arise from these global, global crises. In terms of what they need, they need a good st structure of legislation, policy and regulation in order to do that. Businesses are great. What businesses do best is innovate and find clever new ways to do things. But businesses work within the system that they exist within. So until we have the kind of structural change, the kind of rethinking of our institutions that, that Professor Dasgupta is talking about, then it's really hard for business to make that leap. You will get innovators, you will get people who find a way to make a commercial advantage out of being more sustainable, but that won't be what everyone does. Everyone won't follow that lead until, until the structure is there. Thank you. Okay, uh, the fourth question. Is, uh, there is obviously a close link between action on biodiversity loss and action on tackling climate change. How can the UK government and others bring these conversations together so that the green recovery from the pandemic properly encompasses both climate and biodiversity? Yeah, I think this this is really important. That there's there's a lot of talk around how these things are linked, um, but we're not seeing necessarily joined up policies on it. And we need to see that drive that we have towards net zero being extended into being genuinely sustainable. So for example, um, one of the most common nature-based solutions for climate change is planting trees. Um, but if you plant trees in the wrong place, then you'll actually be having a negative effect, both for biodiversity and potentially for climate. So um, there's a site I've been looking at recently um, where the best thing we can do, both for biodiversity and for climate, is to remove hundreds of hectares of trees to restore the natural bog that's underneath, um, which will sequester far more carbon, which will 
would be far more beneficial for the biodiversity that, that should be in that area, which will have knock-on benefits for water quality in the streams and so on, um, because we need to look at that holistic picture of what should be there, how the natural system should work and how we can work with it. So, so there's that danger that if you just focus on one element, then you'll make some, some choices which will have not necessarily the outcomes you were seeking and sometimes outcomes that are active, actively the reverse of what you were seeking to do. Um, and so I think that we need to make sure that we're bringing together the COPs that happened this year. We're bringing together the, the government advisors and government government specialists who are thinking about these two areas and we make sure that everything is seen through that lens of, of of a holistic approach to well how does this affect the natural environment how does it affect life on the planet and having a net positive impact on life in its broadest sense both both human um, and the natural environment as we possibly can uh, and I don't I don't mean to underestimate that, you know, to, to, to make that sound like it's an easy thing to do. It, it is nothing more and nothing less than completely rethinking society, how we do business and how we, how we go about our day-to-day -day lives. Um, nobody's saying that you can carry on living as though all resources were unlimited when they're not. There will be changes and there will be things that might feel like a sacrifice. You may not be able to have the next version of, of your smartphone that comes out every year. Um, but maybe that isn't what we should be wanting. Maybe we need to think about wanting less and, and doing better and enjoying a better quality of life. Back to you, David. Great. Well, thank you very much and as i said sadly dr ray isn't able to join us now but let's now move on to the q a session and i'd invite our three panelists to turn on their videos and we would be we are joined by sally haynes standing in for dr stephanie gray sally is this is the chief executive of the chartered institute of ecology and environmental management and we're very grateful to you Sally for joining us and I'm I'm going to start with a question to, to Sally and then we will move on to our other participants and it's a fantastic question which follows on from that last exchange with Stephanie uh, Dame Julia Slingo of course formerly the chief scientist at the Met Office absolutely gets us to set this challenge about how we link the two different COPs. A COP just means a conference of the parties. And the UN has a variety of COPs, usually emerging from prior international treaties and conventions that have been signed. So we've got this, this COP 15 on biodiversity in the natural world. And we've got, of course, COP 26 on uh, the climate emergency. Um, how do we ensure that we address these two challenges in a fully consistent way, is what Julia asks. And then she goes on, we get two for the price of one here. She then goes on with a further observation on the very hot topic of, of digital twins and the extent to which major international investment in those kind of integrated modeling, uh, which would combine both weather and climate change and natural ecosystems would be one way in which we could bring the two challenges together. So really good telling points there from Julia. Uh, Sally, um, why don't we hear uh, first from you and then I'll turn to Professor Marley and then Professor Dasgupta. Thank you. And, and thank you very much for the opportunity to support this event. Um, I think the uh, perhaps the short answer is uh, is having the understanding of how uh, the climate emergency and the biodiversity crisis are linked um, and how we do need to tackle them together. So I think a lot of it is about understanding at the political level. Um, I think the um, uh, Steph gave some very good ex examples of, of, of why this is the case, but we have a very short gap between uh, the COP15 and COP26 to take messages from COP15 to COP26. But what we do have in common, I think, is, is the, the policymakers and we have the scientists and the researchers who are actually working across both uh, 
for both areas of, of, of research and both areas of developing action. And what we actually need is uh, the mother of all communication strategies um, to make the kinds of uh, steps forward in terms of understanding and decision making. We need really, really, really good communication um, so that we can see the opportunities for uh, integrating activity, integrating education as well. Nobody's really mentioned education. I think education is a particularly key role to play here. Um, and integrating um, the action that comes out of both COPs so that there is joined up policy making, joined up decision making, um, and joined up action. So it's, um, you know, I, th I think we're on a, uh, a bit of a start of a, um, not quite the end game, but pretty close to the end game of, of really getting these messages home and coming up with uh, both national and international policy and action that doesn't treat these two uh, aspects of our environment separately, but understands the linkages between them. Um, and uh, for me, I put scientists and researchers right at the very heart of that, because they're providing the evidence base on which policy and action derives. So we need to be listening to the scientists um, and we, well, you know, and those same scientists will be uh, informing both COPs so we need to be listening to the scientists, looking at the evidence base um, and um, making sure that what comes out of those two quite seismic events is thoroughly integrated. And that integration is understood uh, by, by decision makers and policy makers. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Sally. Now, Professor Molly, and, uh, and particularly this challenge of whether you could imagine a sort of a digital twin being a way of integrating thinking about natural diversity and climate change. Your observations, please. Great. I'll just briefly respond to the, to the previous one as well first. Uh, I think uh, there's a real opportunity here for, for quite a while, the biodiversity has been sort of the neglected sibling of the climate change crisis. The climate change has been recognized as this existential challenge for quite quite a while, whereas biodiversity has been seen a little bit as nice to have and you know, be ashamed to lose it. But I think, uh, What's happened in the last few years, and, and for a number of events, I think that our scripture review has been also seminal in this, is in showing how much it, biodiversity is an existential um, uh, challenge as well. That if we start pouring apart the, the fabric of, of biodiversity, uh, there are fundamental breakdowns in both our resilience to climate change and to many other, uh, other stresses. So I think there's a real opportunity now that biodiversity is up there on the pedestal alongside climate change as it should be. And to answer the point about the, uh, the digital twins, I th uh, I'm not quite sure what was meant in the phrase digital twins there, but I think this idea of having what, what could be some, uh, next generation modeling that includes the climate system, the complexity of the ecological system and the complexity of the social system in one framework in which we can explore feedbacks and trade-offs uh, is clearly something that, that is desirable and, and I think there are elements of that have been around for a while, but I think our computational power now, our ecological and social understanding are stronger that we could actually do something that's a lot more robust than, than we have now. So I think that this has got to be part of the solution, although you know, producing better and better scenarios is only, improving our understanding is only part of the solution, actually acting on that understanding and having the will to act on it obviously is the, the more profound challenge that we have. Thank you. Thanks very much. Partha, your observations about that, please. I pretty much agree with all that's been said, but I'm trying to move the discussion forward in this, this particular way, which is perhaps it's wrong to think about biodiversity as an object. It's a characteristic of ecosystems. It's like asking, you know, is your portfolio of assets, financial portfolio diverse, or is it uh, concentrated on one thing? And I think it's much more sensible and useful to, and I'm not saying anything that I haven't learned at the feet of my ecology colleagues. Uh, we should be thinking of ecosystems and their functions, what they produce, all the goods and services that they're supplying. And the whole idea that you have climate on the one hand and biodiversity on the other is quite misleading in my judgment, because in, I can easily imagine a scientific move in which you didn't even think of climate as a primary 
you know, uh, service that, that nature provides. I could think of many others. Nitrogen fixation, for example, is an extremely powerful and important uh, function of ecosystems. So we, if we stop by thinking of ecosystem functions and what they do for us, which is a manageable problem because ecosystems differ in size and, and speed hugely. I mean, my mouth is an ecosystem. <laughs> and then the oceans are an ecosystem. So you can have a unified way of thinking about these assets uh, at various levels of, of, of scales. So that's point number one. And if we do that, then I think the idea that we have to be holistic becomes quite banal because by definition, you're going to be holistic because you're really looking at the whole of the biosphere, breaking it up to bits and bits, and, and you know that they're interrelated. And it can be done. And I've tried in the review, the whole entire approach was that. It wasn't about measuring carbon. We didn't talk about biomass uh, as a unit of account. We didn't have any biomass markets, uh, or uh, largely because uh, we wanted to avoid that. I wanted to avoid that and go straight to ecosystem functions. Uh, the, I, think, I think if we do that, then there's cause there is good de de for reason for progress. Final point, I'm very skeptical given my background in economics of very, very large scale global models. They haven't worked in economics. They have been very misleading uh, and it could, they can really tear you into distant areas of uh, discomfort <laughs> and mistakes. It's much better. I think the ecologists are pretty sound on this. They like to study small scale things. Uh, the, the, the small scale could end up being the Amazon, by the way, <laughs> forest. But what I mean is you, have, you, you look at samples and see how the bits and pieces interact with one another. You're looking at integrated systems. So I think I would be, I wouldn't think it would be a great idea to have these mega model of, you know, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the biosphere uh, and, and its various components but work on some small ones. And you recognize at every stage that the small ones are related to one another. You build up from there rather than from the top. Very interesting and a, a useful comment on this whole debate about whether how big a digital twin you can have or whether it's, perhaps this is more what Julia was implying, specific models in specific cases from which you build up. You can put an enormous amount of effort into very large models indeed and then find you are caught out. Um, you, I'm going to jump to an anonymous question. And we, I understand why it's anonymous, because your report, Partha, has a foreword by Sir David Attenborough. And if Sir David Attenborough was in this discussion, he would be adding, I am sure, a point very similar to one made by our anonymous questioner, which is what about the burden of resources simply by the volume of human beings? Is the, is the human population itself now, uh, is reducing the human population, allowing it to decline, going to be a crucial part of easing the carrying burden that we're placing on the natural world? Partha, would you like to comment on that angle? Yes, very much so. I mean, I wish we had an hour to talk about this because this is something that really I have spent a lot of time writing on it, thinking about it, obviously. The review goes into it. Uh, there's a whole chapter connected with population. And of course, what we decompose, the, 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 uh, the review decomposes the global demand that we make on, on, on the biosphere into various factors, one of which is, of course, the size of the population. Uh, then the average demand that the average person makes and then the efficiency with which the nature's goods and services are converted into final goods as, and, as recorded in GDP. So it's one of the three variables affecting our total demand. And there's a trade-off here. Uh, and it's not for nothing that we worry, uh, people like me worry about the fact that we have 7.8 billion people and simultaneously aspiring to higher standards of living as currently measured. That's not on. And that's, I think, the review is absolutely adamant about that. It brings a wealth of data from the, from the ecological sciences, from the earth sciences, and from economic sciences and demographic sciences to show that that's not on. It's not on because we already have overshot by a huge amount margin the total demand we make as compared to the biosphere's ability to supply. So we have a choice, obviously. 
uh, 7.8 billion people could live sustainably, but it will have to be a completely different consumption pattern, which is, of course, what Stephanie was pointing to, I think, very eloquently. But we can't afford to just think that simply if we even tailor off to at 9 billion or 10 billion uh, and you know, stabilize there, all is well. Because one fundamental reason is that nature responds to the demand we make of it. It does not, she does not uh, respond to the first derivative, the rate of change in the demand. And, and she certainly does not respond to the rate of change of the rate of change of demand. So to simply to think that, oh, things are happening, you know, plateauing out is not good enough because in the meanwhile, we could destroy huge chunks of nature in an irreversible way. So yes, I, I'm totally with the questionnaire. And you needn't be anonymous. There's no harm in <laughs> raising this question because it's inevitable. It's absolutely right and proper. Thank you very much. Yadvinda, your observations on that. Uh, I think it's important to highlight the, the consumption side of that as well. It's, uh, uh, when we think of population, inevitably, subconsciously, the, the mind goes to the global south, uh, the large populations. But the, the global north has a disproportionate impact overall because the per capita consumption is so high. And uh, thinking about the, the two ways of addressing that, one is to limit or ultimately decrease that consumption. Uh, and the other one is also to make that consumption as decoupled or as circular as possible. So as many materials are being uh, re recycled and much energy is not pouring waste, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And then many ways that we can make uh, this physical e uh, economy decoupled from the bio, uh, biophysical uh, uh, system or, or re reduced interactions. And I think uh, 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 and that has to be part of the strategy overall, while we also try and at least limit the size or ultimately reduce the size of, of, the, of the consumption. Thank you. Sally? Um, uh, I, I agree. I think it's um, very difficult to um, see a future where there isn't some limits placed on, on consumption. Um, I think there's a lot of effort going into persuading people to think about their consumption, to moderate or reduce their consumption of resources. But I don't think that change is happening quickly enough. Um, and I think that um, there, there may be a need to start thinking more proactively about some kind of um, uh, rationing enforced limits um, making some hard choices because I simply don't think we're going to achieve through uh, persuasion, we're going to achieve enough change quickly enough to um, you know, address the problems that we're talking about. I think we're going to have to have some harsher measures. Now, you know, and a good example around, uh, for example, our, our use of plastic bags. Um, there was a lot of persuasion to make you take less use of plastic bags and then you had to start bringing in some, some hard action to, to make it um, so that you had no choice but to reuse your bags. And, and that's a, a, a very simple example, but I think we are heading in that direction of having to introduce some quite tough measures because I don't think there's enough, while there's greater awareness, I don't think there's enough willingness um, at the moment amongst the, the, the global North to, to really make those tough, tough choices. Thanks very much. Thanks. I, I'm now going to turn to, a, I'm going to link two questions and begin to begin with Professor Marley on this, which is really about politics and governance. One is how we get any decision takers to get beyond the short term, because we all know how important the short term is for us individually and it clearly shapes how we vote. So have we got any levers that make it easier for people to value the long term? And that relates to one example and, and one issue in international governance which is the the open ocean global commons and um, how much we can do beyond the exclusive economic zones of individual nation states through the UN or some other body to to protect um, ocean that is not within a national economic zone so it's all boils down to sort of at the end of these two cops are we hoping for some innovations in, in global decision-taking. Uh, Professor Marley, Yadvinda, over to you first. Okay, all right. Uh, on, on the question of goals, I mean, this is really a question for political scientists, I guess, but uh, I'll give it a go. I think uh, having long-term goals certainly helps that, that uh, in terms of your, your 
a little bit less susceptible to, to the vagaries of uh, uh, short-term politics. So I think the net zero goal in climate has played a huge role in shaping where we're aiming to head to and therefore uh, setting the shorter term goals as well, where do we need to be in 10 years time for this mid-century net zero goal. And I'm pleased to see that the, the goals on biodiversity are also being established. And I think they, they give at least some sort of long-term target that each government has to try and uh, 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 commit to. Uh, I think another aspect is societal change. If we have buy-in by society into where we want to head through education, through uh, just a, a popular opinion about what is desirable, about the value of nature, then it, uh, again, those, those changes are much more likely to be carried on on, on a longer term uh, be, be, be because they have a popular mandate uh, to be carried on. Uh, on that question around the, the open oceans, uh, that's an interesting one and is a challenge. Uh, there are other areas of the world that have, uh, like the Antarctic or like Svalbard, that have, have come into international agreement uh, as having some sort of international agreement in terms of how they're regulated. I have a colleague who's a marine scientist who proposes that we switch the status of the open oceans from being a, a, an open commons to being a, a global marine protected area in which you then, uh, the default is not to exploit the open oceans and then you uh, make a case to exploit them. Uh, so it's changing the, the zero setting or what the assumption is of these, uh, these open commons and how they are used. Thank you very much. Uh, Parthi, your observations on that? Right, well, the global commons, it's, uh, that's something I touched upon in my answers to your earlier question, previous questions. I was hoping that it's a long shot. I don't think it's gonna happen. But I'm not a great believer in simply having agreements reached because they're violated so very easily. Um, I have in mind that we, after the Second World War, the nations were uh, were far sighted and uh, in, in in establishing international institutions like the World Bank and the IMF, and they were also designed to supply public goods, global public goods. Uh, and uh, we should we should be really thinking hard about establishing one to uh, to, to to protect and manage the global commons like the uh, op open oceans, open seas, uh, because if you, if you collect rents for their use, uh, that would be a huge amount of uh, revenue that could be generated for all sorts of conservation process projects and God knows what else. Uh, that's that's one. But then we have also global commons in the form of peatlands and the. Uh, uh, tropical rainforests, and they happen to be, however, within national jurisdiction. So what does a good economist suggest should be done? Obviously, they should be compensated for protecting them, because they're buying a global public good. Everybody enjoys the benefits, and they would be bearing the cost, entire cost of, of, of protecting them. So some subsidy is required, and for that, uh, when I say subsidy, it'll be like payment for ecosystem services, which is now quite commonly used in countries like Costa Rica and and uh, China at the local level. But, to, uh, but here I'm talking now globally, that's a whole lot, same idea goes there. So that's one class of things. And finally, can I just simply say, we have actually, my, my colleagues, uh, eminent colleagues, they actually avoided the issue of population by shifting it back to consumption. And I had suggested that yes, there's a trade-off here, but the trade-off is ununiform, un which is what, what Professor Malhi was pointing out and absolutely correctly. But bear in mind, at the moment, there are things that we should be doing, but we're not. We talk about women's liberation, their empowerment, but over 200 million women in their reproductive ages uh, have an unmet need for family planning. They express the desire for it, but they haven't got the equipment and the knowledge and the facilities. And we're not doing anything about it. In other words, our, the, the, the foreign aid going to family planning from the OECD countries is less than 1% goes to family planning. And yet we say, well, uh, uh, women's empowerment is extremely important. And of course it is, but that you're not going to fulfill it if you don't allow their control over their own bodies. So we use an euphemism by saying everything can be handled but through education. And yet after all these years of in investment in education, uh, the World Bank reports that a third of women in the ages of 15 to 24 in the uh, in poor countries are still illiterate. So there's a good deal we can do uh, on, on population to
to bring about uh, fertility transitions in countries which are far away from it. And that will help them because it's their future which matters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Sally, I hope you'll forgive me. I'm going to quickly, as we've just got a few minutes left, I'm going to turn to you next, but I'm going to add some other questions because it's also people's opportunity to make a final comment. Uh, Christopher Smith um, comes at this from an interesting angle as executive chair of the Arts and Humanities Research Council, asking where do the arts and humanities fit in? As we're here talking about deep issues in cultural behaviour and creative thinking, what contribution can they make? Um, and uh, we've also got an interesting question. What newspaper headline would you like to see after COP15? So each of our panelists has a brief opportunity in the remaining four minutes, just a final remark, but raise our horizons. Where, do the, where does culture and art fit into all this? Sally, you first. Uh, as I said previously, I think um, there needs to be uh, the mother of all communication strategies around, uh, around this. And I think the... Uh, Arts and, and humanities have an enormous way, an enormous potential to reach out to people um, and, and to communicate some of the key messages that we want to. Um, uh, I've already seen some excellent work in the past, and I think um, that it, it, it's potentially very, very enriching and very exciting to be using all communication tools at our disposal to get these messages across. So I hope they have a very big part to play. Thanks very much indeed. Yadvinda, your final observations. I think the, the, the most intrinsic and fundamental value of the biosphere is that it is the matrix that creates us and surrounds us. And we have this visceral connection to nature that, that the pandemic's made really apparent in some cases. And, uh, and some, that emotive connection is best communicated through the arts and the humanities and the deeper cultural understanding of, of the role that nature plays in making, making us. And so, so I think it's a huge role uh, in, in getting beyond words and and accounting other things to, to this deeper connection with nature uh, that can be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. And Partha, the final word to you. Well, I think I'll just uh, I'll supplement the comments that have already been made on this. I think we could start at a much more democratic level, at the level of every child, uh, having nature studies as compulsory. That is, if it's introduced at uh, the primary school level, and revisited through tertiary education. Uh, we have the three, three R's here, and we should mm -hmm. add it forth, which is nature studies. And the, your love for nature can only uh, uh, arise if you actually handle nature, the soil mucking around, you know, in soils and trying to see what's there, the fungus and the, the earthworms and so forth. I would say that will be the beginnings of a cultural revolution if you can do that. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thanks to our panelists. We're very grateful to uh, Professor Partha Dasgupta, who of course his report is not currently being considered by the Treasury and we will look forward to the Treasury's response to it uh, later this year. Uh, Professor uh, Marley, thank you for your comments. And, and Sally Haynes, thank you so much for joining us at short notice. We do appreciate it um, as after uh, Stephanie wasn't able uh, to join us. Thank you for that. Um, we will be, uh, a recording of this event will be available on our website tomorrow. Our next meeting complements this very well. It will be on the 28th of June and the subject will be developing a systems approach to net zero. Uh, thank you all very much indeed for coming. Thank you for the excellent questions. I'm sorry there wasn't time to cover everyone uh, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much.